Welcome to Beyond the Crucible, the podcast that dares to talk about setback and failure, but not so we can commiserate, so we can elevate. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show, and our mission today is to offer you the hope that your crucible experiences, those tragedies and challenges you faced or are facing right now, do not define you. They refine you. They did not happen to you. They happened for you. And no one knows that better than the host of the show, the founder of Crucible Leadership, and my friend, Warwick Fairfax. Warwick, welcome. This is going to be a, another fascinating discussion, and it's also bonus points because our guest happens to live in Australia, which makes this, I think, our eighth guest or so from there and only four guests from Wisconsin where I'm at, but I'm not <laughs> bitter. I wonder how that happens. Who knows? But uh, yeah, great to be here. Um, that guest today, listener, is Sarah uh, Willoughby, and she's a transformation coach, infertility coach, best-selling author, speaker, and Reiki practitioner. Passionate about empowering people to heal, love themselves, achieve more, and transform their lives, Sarah guides her clients to reconnect with themselves and find the answers that lie deep inside. Sarah's podcast appearances and inspiring articles about life have reached millions of people worldwide. Her new book, Infertility Saved My Life, Healing PCOS from the Inside Out, exposes the raw teaching moments of Sarah's journey to self-love through polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS, and secondary infertility. Originally from the UK, Sarah attained an honors degree in business studies postgraduate diploma in human resource management, and spent 10 years working in corporate P HR, not PR. I'm in PR. She was in HR. Following her admission into intensive care in 2009, Sarah promised herself that if she recovered, she would face her fears, commit to her calling, and make a difference in this crazy world. The last words of her bio, she writes, life is short. Indeed it is, Warwick. So take it away. Well, thank you, Sarah, for being here. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Well, yes, and uh, I think I mentioned off air, I love your accent, which is a uh, combination English and Australian. I think, as I said before, the best of both worlds. So it's uh, <laughs> fabulous. Absolutely. Uh, Though I fit in neither country. When I go back to the UK, yeah. they think I'm Australian. And when I come here, they think I'm English. <laughs> well, I, I have a little bit of that, you know, growing up in Australia, having gone to college in England and then uh, I lived in the US for a lot of years. So uh, sort of a trilingual deal a bit. But, um, <laughs> You know, I first uh, heard about you, just saw some posting on social media, saw that you've got a book coming out uh, with Morgan James. I guess the uh, the ebook's coming out in June, which will be when the podcast, yeah. and then later printed later in the year. So my book was published late last year, uh, October 2021 by Morgan James. So yeah, that's we have that in, in common, which is fabulous. Um, and just the title of your book, Infertility Saved My Life. I mean, it's just, it's counterintuitive and there's a whole story there that we'll unpack. So I loved the title and the butterfly on the, on the front and just on your website, you know, when you talk about is, is this your opportunity to transform your, your life? You talk about this is the right place if you're ready to heal, love yourself, achieve more, transform your life. So I just love just what you're about and... Obviously, your story is anchored by your crucible with uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS, which I must confess I had not heard of until uh, reading about you. But before we get a bit into your story, tell us a bit about the backstory. You know, you grew up, uh, I think you mentioned, in England before coming to Australia a number of years ago. So what's a bit of the backstory that makes Sarah Willoughby, you know, kind of who you are and some of the threads that uh, I'm sure you've picked up later on absolutely so yeah I grew up in the UK and I sort of lived that typical life I, I went to school I studied hard I spent six years at university and I followed the corporate path so this life that I had expected for myself and other people expected for me 
So I worked my way up the corporate ladder and I got there and I wasn't happy. It wasn't filling me with joy, but I didn't know how to leave because I felt like it was already too late, which is really ironic because I was actually only still in my early 20s. But mm. I felt like I put so much work into, into this life and I knew where I was going and then it didn't, um, didn't really make my heart sing. So at the same time, I was going and I was really stressed. I just want to say, you know, working in the corporate world was very, very stressful. And I didn't feel like I was being a good employee, a good wife and a good mother at the time. I just felt like I was sort of in survival mode, not thriving for sure. And at the same time, I was just going on this journey to try and have a second child. And that's where it all started to fall apart. You know, it's fascinating. We've just had a series with, you know, finishing called Second Act Significance about, in one sense, an element of your story, which is, you know, people in a cubicle and a job. And we had one guy, Robert Miller, that was a lawyer in New York for decades. And he always wanted to be a musician, but it didn't seem to be practical. And he was pulling down a decent salary and he had, you know, wife, kids and Eventually, in his late late fifties, he decided to pivot and go into music, and he's been very successful. But there's a lot of folks who are just in the cubicle and thinking, "Is this all there is?" You're probably in an environment where your parents and friends said, "Sarah, you know, you got to be practical. You know, dreaming is all yeah. fine, but you got to pay the mortgage, pay the rent. Life is not easy, and you're, you're trying to be a good employee, but you've got a young family and." you know, young mothers, I mean, that, that's, a, that's really tough when you've got to do it all. And, you know, sleep is optional, kind of somewhere fitted <laughs> in there. So, you know, that, you were probably on that, you know, I'm sure you, you know, loved your son and, you know, husband and, and life and all, but it, it just probably felt like, is this all there is? Was that a bit of your story, sort of pre, you know, PCOS? It really was. It was, I always felt like something was missing but I didn't know what it was and I didn't know where to find it. And so because I didn't know where I was headed, I just remained stuck. And I think that's really common. We think that we have to have the whole path lined up and can see the end result before we start taking that next step, not understanding that when we take a step, then it leads to the next step. I always liken it to when you're studying in fog. If we don't move forward, we just can't see anything. And the path is never going to reveal itself. But as you slowly move through it and safely move through it, you you start it sort of starts to clear. So that's one of the things that I, I learned the hard way is that when we remain frozen, nothing changes. We just stagnate. And I liked, and I like the fact the phrase you used a couple of minutes ago about how what you were doing did not bring your heart alive. And what I love about that phrase is what We've said it many times, guests have said it many times, but it crosses, I mean, here we've got, I'm a Midwesterner in the US, you've lived in the UK and Australia, Warwick's from Australia, and now he lives out East in the US, but that phrase resonates across cultures, this idea of your heart not being alive, and that is really a lot of what we talk about here at Beyond the Crucible, and not just in the series Second Act Significance, but just in general as we talk to guests like you. So it's just fascinating to me that that phrase um, sort of dots so many of the conversations we have. Yeah, yeah for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, I wonder if, before we get into your Crucible experience, if there's an additional cultural aspect uh, in having lived, obviously, in Australia, but also in England, in both countries, there can be a bit of a risk aversion. If you try to do something different, it's like, oh, come on, you know, this is cynicism, whether it's at the pub or wherever, you know, your mates, your friends, uh, it's like, well, you know, be smart, play it safe. And, you know, what are you thinking about doing something different? That won't work. Oh, come on. The U.S. tends to celebrate entrepreneurship, but at least when I was growing up, you know, do, being different wasn't exactly celebrated, at least from my perspective in Australia or the UK. Is that your experience? Yeah, I think so. It's very much the mentality around who are you to step up and shine your mm. light and live your true path, whereas now I live from who am I not to, and actually I need to, I need to do this. This is an act of service, not just for myself and my, filling my own heart up, but this is an act of service to the world. Because if we all live our authentic life, we all 
step up and find our talents and embrace who we really are, then the ripple effect of that is crazy. You know, you've got happy people living happy lives. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's life changing. Absolutely. You know, the courage to be yourself and who you were born to be. So talk about PCOS and there's probably some listeners, um, maybe a number who don't know what that is. That was, it changed your life in a lot of bad ways, but it seems like incredibly given your books called Infertility Saved My Life, there was some good that came out of just horrendous tragedy. So talk a bit about you know, life was swimming along, you had a corporate job, a young son, husband, you know, maybe life could have been better, but it doesn't sound like it was terrible. Um, No, and from from the, yeah, from the outside looking in, I had it all. You know, I I had a beautiful lifestyle, I traveled, I had a good income, I had, you know, I was using my brain, I'd spent six years at university, so that was important to me. But my desire to have another child was, you know, the thing that really was pushing me forward in life um, and was very challenging. So I found out in my early 20s that I had PCOS. It was actually a very late diagnosis. And because I'd had my son very easily, I didn't think that I was going to struggle to have a second child. It just didn't even enter my mind. It took me two years to conceive. And at that point, I then had what's called a missed miscarriage, which is when everything is still, you're still uh, releasing all the pregnancy hormones, but your baby's actually died. So a lot of women find out at their scan, a 12-week scan, that their baby had died a number of weeks before, and you have no idea. So at that point, I had to decide whether to wait for a natural miscarriage or whether to have surgery to remove everything, um, because it the pregnancy can continue for weeks and weeks and weeks. So I opted for surgery and that was really, really hard, really mm. hard. And a lot of women go through this. Um, I actually ended up in a, on a ward where lots of young girls were having abortions. So effectively the same operation, but for different reasons and no judgment around that. We're mm. all at different stages in our life, but that was very, very confronting. It was like, I felt like, you know, the universe had put a baby in the wrong body sort of thing. Um, And I felt very numb when I woke up from that surgery and I was crying. And one of the nurses said to me, do you want to speak to the hospital chaplain? And even though I wasn't religious, I I said yes. And that was absolutely life-changing for me because she was the first person that I acknowledged that I lost a baby. And I think for a lot of women and, and men going through infertility, there isn't that acknowledgement that you have lost a child. It's, you know, like, oh, it's just a group of cells or, you know, just get over it. So there isn't that compassion and understanding. And she actually allowed, she put on a proper funeral service for my family. Um, So me and my my ex-husband and my son. And that was beautiful. And the reason I share that is because for anybody going through infertility, there is a grieving process that you need to go through and there is an acknowledgement of the life that was, that grew inside you, that you felt, but a life that also now is not going to be. So that was really important for me. And from there, I basically was told there wasn't really much that they could do for me with, with how my body was reacting to everything. So I, I was told go through IVF. So IVF is an emotional roller coaster. You're taking hormones. You, um, it's, it's something that's done, again, behind closed doors. You don't talk about it. You don't want people to know. So I'm trying to carry on with this really stressful job and, and hold down my life at the same time that I'm trying to have another child. We went over to Norway, actually, to have the IVF because we'd lost a lot of faith in the UK system. And they'd messed up a lot of my care and detrimentally. So went over to Norway, had um, IVF treatment. And unfortunately, my body didn't like the drugs and it reacted very badly. And I ended up in intensive care. And I can genuinely say I hope I never experienced that level of physical pain in my life because I was on morphine and it didn't even take the edge off the pain. It was very, very confronting. 
I put on about 20 kilograms of fluid in about 72 hours. My body just filled up with fluid. I had fluid on my lungs. I couldn't breathe. I felt like I was drowning. I had an enlarged heart. I was at risk of blood clots. And there was just nothing that the doctors could do to stop the deterioration. They just have to treat each symptom as it arose. And I guess one of the most defining moments was realising that I may not recover and having to send my son back to the UK with his grandma and he walked out of the hospital doors holding his rabbit, his well-loved rabbit in one hand and his grandmother's hand um, in the other and just turned around and looked at me and smiled and I smiled at him and I thought, I hope, I hope I'm okay. I hope I get to raise you. Um, that was really challenging and it made me realise, uh, you know, like, what have I done? This was an elective procedure. I've put myself in this position and I felt guilt and I felt shame and, and just excruciating physical, emotional, mental, spiritual pain. Wow. I mean, thank you for sharing that because obviously I know it's not easy and you share it for a purpose, you know, to serve others, which will get into but you have a mixture of horrendous physical pain and emotional pain i mean there's probably a whole sea of different things you're going through i would imagine there's probably a number of people a number of other women that have never heard of this sort of secondary um infertility your average yes. person average woman i imagine thinks you know once you get pregnant the first time you're probably good to go you know, Absolutely. obviously, as you get older, it gets tough. As you get closer to 40, it gets pretty difficult. It, when you're in your 20s, in theory, it's easier. And then it gets harder as the day, as you go from 20 to 30 to 40. And so there's probably a lot of women that says, well, Sarah, how, how can that possibly be? I mean, you, you've already had a child. How can there be an issue, right? You probably didn't. Yeah. You probably thought, once I've had that first one, I'm good to go. Things are working yeah. the way they're meant to, and let's go. So... Did you find other women, like, what is it? And just couldn't understand what you were talking about? I think there is a lot of guilt for me around feeling the loss and the grief and the confusion and the resentment towards my own body because I'd already had a child. So I knew a lot of people who were struggling to have their first child. So this is something that a lot of women going through secondary infertility feel like they can't even talk about it. So there's there's a silence, an even bigger silence around secondary infertility because you feel like you should just be happy that you've, you've had a child. And, of course, I was. It was my right. life. So what you're saying is there are some women who've never had a child would, would be saying maybe in their worst moments, and we all have them, who are you to complain? I would do yeah. anything to have a little boy, a little girl, you know, a little child. You yeah. know? And so they probably, they probably found it very difficult to understand why you would be because yeah. you can't go you can't really empathize fully with something you've never experienced you know no. which they obviously and, have. that's the same in life for anything isn't it until we've walked in somebody else's shoes we just can't understand but i think because there's so much silence and stigma and shame around infertility and it's something we don't talk about i think that's what makes it harder whereas if you're on a different health journey it's there's a lot less silence around some of the other big issues that people face so that's why I share my story because I want to break that silence I want to really shine a light on this and take away that shame because we know that shame is the lowest vibration and when we shine a light on shame we take away the power that it holds over us so you've talked obviously a bit about the the physical uh excruciating pain but it sounds like as bad maybe worse I don't know but as bad with just the emotional torment that this the mixture of, of 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 shame of you know uh, you know what what have I almost done to my son? I mean, every mother is going to think nobody's going to be able to care for my child the way I can. That's just I think a part of being human, a part of being a mother. And nothing against grandparents or husband or you know you feel like yeah, I want it to be me, you know, because I'm going to yeah. love my child in a way that no body else on the planet is going to be able to do that's just your natural feeling i'm sure so you've got that sense of maybe shame anger resentment maybe there was some anger and resentment against 
universe, God, or whatever. It's like, how can I? So talk a bit about those sea of emotions, both towards you, towards others, and maybe even to a higher power, whoever's up there. Talk a bit about some of those emotions. Yeah, I think for me, it made me realize how much resentment and hatred I had towards my own body. You know, I, I was like, why is this happening? What have I, what have I done wrong? You know, was I a, a bad person in a past life? Like what, you know, like what, what's going on here? What lesson am I not learning? I always knew, I've always believed that there's a lesson or in a gift, you know, in everything that we experience, that nothing is black or white, you know, life is about duality. So I knew that there was a bigger purpose for all of it. But when I'm lying in hospital and I was in the same situation where the room that I was in became an abortion clinic and mm. you've got all these young girls coming in and there's just, without being too graphic, but I'm going to share this and it might shock some people. There was just, there was blood all over the bathroom, all over the floor that they left to clear up until the next day. And then the next day, another group of young girls and their mums and boyfriends would come in and sit in the beds opposite me and, and laugh and then cry when the physical pain took over and then leave. And that for me was just, that was the height of emotional torment because, again, it was that thing of, you know, again, you've put the wrong baby in the wrong body again, you know, like, are you kidding me? Um, so I had this, I had a lot of nights by myself, you know, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't, um, I couldn't read. I couldn't watch TV. I couldn't do anything. I was in too much pain. Um, but when I actually started to recover, when the process starts to reverse itself and the doctors realized that I was going to be okay, which was incredible. Um, one of the consultants who actually wasn't working on my ward at the time, she came in, it was about 10 o'clock at night and she came and she sat down and she put her hand on my leg and she said, you've been really lucky. And then she looked away and she had tears in her eyes and she became like my guardian angel. I, I have so much gratitude for her because I really understood in that moment what she was telling me. You know, she was telling me, you're lucky to be alive. Life is really short. And that's the message that I try to share with people now is don't wait until you're in the situation that I was in. I got the biggest kick up the bum from the universe and I'm grateful for that because it changed my life. So that's why my book is called Infertility Saved My Life because it saved me from a life that would have lacked resonance. It took me on a different path, but the path that I was destined to be on that I had been too scared to follow. So in that moment when she'd left and I reflected and I lay in bed by myself and I thought, I have to, I have to step up for myself and for other people. I have to be who I need to be. And I have to make these decisions to, to move forward in my life. Um, and then from there we went, um, I recovered, um, went back to the UK. Fortunately, they had done um, the egg retrieval. So I had 10 frozen embryos. And when I recovered, I went back to Norway. And I had two transferred and I got pregnant with twins. And I was like, this is why it's happened. I'd always had this romantic notion of twins and I was so excited. And we'd already started planning an immigration to the UK, uh, to Australia, sorry. And so my whole life was going to come over here, family of five. And then in that process of moving over here, I lost one of the twins and then I lost the other one. And then I sat with myself and thought, do I go? Do I stay? I've got nothing left to lose. We've got to go. We've got to start a new life. And we had no jobs to come to. We didn't know anybody. We just threw it all up in the air. We left the UK in the recession, so we couldn't even go back. If things hadn't worked out, we wouldn't walk back into our jobs. And we came over here, began a new life. And I surrendered. And I think that's what changed emotionally for me was I let go. I just surrendered. I let go. My life went into flow. I had this pivotal moment of lying on my bed thinking I feel peaceful for the first time in life, in my life. Don't ever let me forget that. And within six weeks, I fell pregnant with my daughter, who is now 11. And then four years later, I had my other daughter, who is now seven. And for me, just that surrender to life was, was life-changing. And again, that's what I try and share with other people, that we don't have we have all the answers inside, but we can't always hear them. So let's connect with self to find them. 
but it's okay also to not have all the answers at any point in time. Just take that first step. Just be brave. Mm. Show up for yourself. So, boy, there's there's so much of what you've said. I mean, it sounds like your worst moment, this whole PCOS infertility changed the direction of your life, ultimately for the positive, you know, it was extremely Absolutely. painful experience. Um, and sometimes, certainly in my case, which is extremely different, and as somebody's told me several times, you can't compare crucibles, you know, losing a $2 billion, you know, family media business, which wasn't so much about the money, but 150 years of heritage, felt like I'd let down generations of my family and, you know, even the country in some warped sense. And, you know, it was pretty, pretty uh, uh, difficult experience. And I also left in this case to go to the US, my wife's American. So everybody's experience is, di is different. But talk about, um, I think you've begun to is how you let go of some of those negative emotions, whether it's anger towards the universe, uh, a, a, some sense of self-loathing, self-hatred of, you know, how could I do this to my son? Or how did you let go of those negative emotions to surrender that, I don't know, it doesn't seem like it was a coincidence that after that happened, you had, you know, two more beautiful children. I mean, what was, because I know a lot of listeners are going to be wondering, well, Sarah, how could you let go of that, that, that anger to yourself and to the world and the universe? How did you, you know, how could you let go of that series, a sea of negative emotions and anger and frustration and shame? When my body healed itself and I had no long-term symptoms, I realized how amazing our bodies are. And I also realized that the relationship that I had with myself and what I was saying to myself was the most important one. Whether we like it or not, we're stuck with ourselves for the rest of our lives. It's the only relationship that is guaranteed. And I made that conscious decision that it was going to be a good one and that I was going to practice self-care and that I was going to nurture myself. And instead of putting myself last, I was going to start putting myself first. And as women, a lot of us don't do that. We we nurture and care for everybody else and we give so much of ourselves to everybody else that we have nothing left really for ourselves. But the analogy around you can't pour from an empty cup is so true. And our cup doesn't just need to be full. It needs to be overflowing so that we're not taking from the cup at any point. And that's the work that I do with a lot of people is helping them to understand that if you're okay, your family will be okay and those people around you will be okay. But if you fall over, then nobody's okay. So I think that change around mindset of celebrating my body, realizing that our body gives us clues all the time. We get a lot of our answers from our body. We feel it in our body. We get that gut instinct, intuition, whatever you want to call it, but we have that deep knowing. And when we can tune into that, then we are always on the right path. We just need to get rid of the distractions and actually be able to learn how to tune in. So that was really important for me in that, in that journey of healing and, and realizing that anger was not serving me. And it's okay to be angry. You know, like we actually have to acknowledge our emotions and I'd pushed a lot of them away. And I think that was what changed too, was that I was able to start labeling how I was feeling and observe it without getting pulled into the drama and then allow it to just move through my body and let it go. Because an emotion only really lasts for about 90 seconds, but we push it away. We push it away. We push it away. We don't want to feel it because it feels uncomfortable, but we need to do that because it's not the emotion that's the problem. It's what we do with the emotion and our behavior around that. That's the issue. On the subject of emotions, and I, I might have heard you wrong, but a while back in this conversation, I thought I heard you say, and I'd love, and if it's, if this is what you said, I'd love you to unpack it a little bit, that shame is the lowest vibration. Did you say that? Yes. Yeah. What does that, that just struck me as very profound. What do you mean by that? Because that, that a lot of people who go through crucibles, who have those experiences that change the trajectory of their lives, feel shame over it. Warwick went through that. I've gone through yeah. that. What does that mean? It's the lowest vibration. What it means is, you know, my belief system is that we are all energetic beings having a, a physical experience. And when we are in, 
we naturally resonate with, with people, don't we? We're drawn to certain people. We're drawn to certain situations. And that's all energy. But shame is the lowest vibration in terms of when we sit in that energetic space, we, that's where a lot of people commit suicide. That's where a lot of people go in their darkest days and their darkest moments. But what disempowers shame is talking about it, is shining a light on it, is bringing it to light and realising that a lot of the things that we are ashamed of, people don't look at it in the same way. We hold a lot within ourselves and when we actually share it with other people, we realise that nobody else feels that way. So. It really is about, you know, talking to other people, whoever you feel comfortable um, sharing that with or somebody that's completely objective and just bringing it to light and starting to unpack it. But Dr. Brownie Brown, I encourage people to read her work, follow her. She's been an incredible inspiration to me on my journey about understanding vulnerability. That's another one that is really difficult for people to understand. Um, shame, empathy, courage, being brave. Um, her journey in itself is really, really inspiring. You know, she now works with Oprah Winfrey and um, and her TED Talk. I really encourage people to watch her TED Talk because it's gone viral. Yeah, I mean, absolutely big fan of Brenna, Dr. Brenna Brown and vulnerability that's so true. I mean, you've highlighted so many important things that's like, useful for listeners to understand. I mean, one of the things that we find a lot in talking to guests is um, you go through a horrendous crucible like you did and you have a choice. You can, you know, stay under the covers and be angry and bitter, you know, certainly pre your two girls because you want to know that that was to happen and maybe it wouldn't have if if you were consumed by anger. Who's to say? But I think you yeah. mentioned before if it wasn't for surrendering, it's obviously it seemed like you feel there was a cause and effect between surrendering and you know your two beautiful younger children but um so some people just stay angry at themselves hate themselves hate their loved ones hate god hate the universe and you wonder how does that serve you all that hatred and anger i mean it doesn't but you made a choice not to not to go there not to stay there and to move forward and the other things you've shared is so helpful is most human beings go through tragedies of one description or another. Life is not smooth, typically. Uh, and so just being willing to talk about it, uh, you know, I'm blessed. My uh, wife and I, recently, who's American, we've lived here for many years, has recently ce- celebrated our 33rd anniversary. And when I have negative emotions, which I do from time to time. I'm pretty mm-hmm. healthy. I like to think emotionally, but stuff happens and I need somebody to talk about while well, she's my go-to. I mean, over the years, you know, uh, a while back I have received counseling. I think counseling, I think is, is always a helpful opportunity uh, when needed, you know, and so don't, there should not be a stigmatism towards that. I think it's a sign of bravery. I think we all know best when is that time and uh, you know, uh, but just talking about it, you know, talking about shame and all those other emotions, the pa- the negative power is in large part removed when you talk about it and you pro- process it. Okay, how do I move forward? How do I n- not let this control me? And d- does that make sense? I mean, I, th- I think that's what you're saying is just, and so pe- many people think, oh, if they only knew me, if they only knew these deep, dark secrets that hate me, and some mm-hmm. will, but there's many that won't and say, you know, Sarah, it's okay. You know, I'm with you. I don't judge you. I don't I don't see you as a bad person. I see you as a wonderful person. So, you know, help listeners understand why that's so important, just the, the willingness to, you know, seek help and certainly seek help from, from others, being willing to share these things. Yeah, certainly when I was going through IVF, I fortunately had sought the help of a hypnotherapist. And one of the best pieces of advice that she gave me is that a lot of people make the mistake of allowing their tragedy or their whatever they're going through, their lowest moments, to define them. And like you said, we have a choice. We can use our pain to be powerful and become our purpose in some way, or we can allow it to take us down. So 
I think mindset is just this crazy journey of every day having to catch our own thoughts because we are so critical. What we say in our own heads, we wouldn't dream of saying to other people. And when we actually start to acknowledge some of those negative mindsets that, we, you know, the repetitive mindset that we have that is very derogatory, then we are halfway there to being able to stop it. We have 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day. 90% of those are repeated from the day before and 80% of those thoughts are negative. So we're already on this uphill battle of, you know, every day having to really work hard to, to change what's going on in our minds. And one of the things that's helped me is the word yet. So putting the word yet on the end of a sentence, I, I don't understand it yet. I'm not, I'm not good at that yet is really empowering. So there's lots of little things that we can do to actually help to reframe how we show up for ourselves and other people. And like I said, finding people that we trust. So finding a tribe, whatever you're going through in life, finding people that just love you for you, that understand you, that realizing we don't have to be perfect all the time, that's impossible. We can't be. There's a perfection in imperfection. When we start to be brave and we start to really be who we came here to be, we attract all those people into our lives that help us to continue to be our best version. So it's like this vicious cycle and it's a beautiful one when we actually mm. trust ourselves. You know, there's this phrase, I don't know if it's biblical or not, but it's certainly not one I created, but there's this phrase of broken uh, and beautiful. I think we're mm. all broken. I've certainly been broken by my whole, you know, billion dollar takeover and the shame that went with that and the, you know, understandable negative press and, you know, anybody that grows up in a wealthy background as I did, there's typically a fair amount of uh, dysfunction and uh, not always healthy relationships. That's normal. So, you know, I've experienced some of that. And so and I'm a, you know, executive coach and you're a coach as well. And I'm, I'm extremely reflective. So I like to feel like I know myself pretty well. And are there aspects of myself that are broken that I wish were not like that? Sure. But there's certain things I can't change, but I'm willing to say, okay, yeah, there are certain things that are a bit broken, but that's okay. You know, yes. it's uh, fueled me with a passion to help others, maybe given me some level of uh, empathy. Um, and just over the years, one of the things I've found, and I have a feeling you do too, because I know you're big into mindfulness. I'm a person of faith. So I sort of translate that as, I'm a big believer in prayer and scripture meditation, but it's, you know, I think you can all come under the umbrella of sort of uh, the inner journey and mindfulness, if you will. Um, yes. Over time, I've, I've thought of like dealing with our emotional selves, which never goes away. It's sort of like physical exercise. You would never say, well, I worked out last month. I'm good to go. No, <laughs> you've got yeah. to walk, run, <laughs> whatever you do every day, every week. To be physically fit, you've got to eat right. Well, same is true emotionally. It's, you know, like, you know, I don't know, last few weeks I had a period where I was, life was going super well, but for a variety of reasons, I was feeling kind of down. It's like, life is going so well. Why could I be feeling down and I couldn't shake it, you know? And there were reasons, which yeah. I don't need to bore listeners with right this second, but I <laughs> talk with my wife, Gail, and it's like, what is it? And some from my past and... I don't know, uh, it's it's sort of trivial, but, you know, some estate planning stuff with my wife, whose uh, mother died recently, triggered some, you know, stuff in my own background that wasn't related to at all, made no sense whatsoever, but it just, a simple little thing triggered a sea of negative emotion. So I processed it, we talked about it, prayed about it, you know, did my scripture meditation, and eventually got my way out of it. But that's just life. Even when you feel like, you know, you and I might feel like we're in a good place, you know, we're contributing to the world, but we're human, right? Yes. Tomorrow could be a bad day. And, yeah. it, you know, and you just got to, does that make sense? A bit like exercise, you just got, you got the tools, you got your tribe, people you can talk to, your meditation techniques, 
but you know, you, you just, you just got to keep at it and you know, it does work. I don't know if that makes any degree of sense. It makes complete sense to me. Absolutely. It is like a muscle. You've got to keep using it. You've got to practice these things. You've got to be gentle with yourself and there's going to be days when you don't, you don't get it right, but it's that willingness to keep get, get getting back up and, and getting, I think I find I get back up quicker. So when I go through challenging times of which there are many in life, like you said, that is what it is to be human, but the ability to get up to notice what's happening in my mindset and be able to, to stop it quicker and then get back up quicker and move forward and not go into judgment over it. Because when we put judgment over the initial emotion of shame, anger, disappointment, hurt, whatever it is, then we're putting a secondary emotion on top that we've then got to unpack and heal later on. And that makes it even more difficult for ourselves. So it's holding us ourselves in a space of love and grace and just allowing ourselves to feel what we feel with non-judgment, non-attachment to our emotions. And that takes a lot of practice. And I don't claim to always get that right, far from it, <laughs> but I'm certainly willing to keep trying and I will keep trying until I take my last breath. And hopefully that's a long time from now. <laughs> I, I want to pivot to talking about your book, but I, I love that phrase, love and grace. I think if there's one thing listeners should remember about what you've said is, you know, we need to give ourselves a bit of, of a break, show ourselves some love and grace. And, um, you know, that's, uh, we're imperfect. You know, it doesn't mean we don't need to atone, apologize for the mistakes that we make, but sometimes we're our own worst critic, even after we've done the practical things that we need to do. And sometimes there are practical things, you know, give yourself some slack, surround yourself with others that will show you love and grace. If you're surrounded with a bunch of people that want to tear you down, I would submit you're in the wrong tribe. You know, yes. be around people yes. that love and care for you. You know, life is too short. So talk about what motivated you to write that book, and uh, which I think you've talked about some of, and what your, from my words, if you don't mind me, your ministry, your work, your coaching. Um, yeah, just what do you feel that your life's, mission is through this book and uh you know your mission to help others is yeah so the reason I wrote the book and it has been a very confronting journey because it's my story so I know that you will understand that so the first part of the book is is the memoir it's it's my life story and how I got to where I am now and then the second part are the tools and techniques and wisdom and insight that I learned along the way things that I wish I'd known sooner uh, as well that, that helped me through that. So I wanted it to be a really sort of practical resource for people. So it wasn't just a story of, so what, what do I do now? How does that impact my life? How can I move forward? I wanted to integrate the two things. But the reason that I wrote it is primarily because I don't want anybody else to go through what I felt when I was going through my infertility journey because I felt so much shame silence, stigma, isolation, and I dealt with a lot of this behind closed doors. And we don't need to because the statistics show so many people all around the world are dealing with this. We all know somebody who is dealing with infertility or we will do. And those figures are increasing. So we can hold space for those people. Even if we don't understand that journey, we can hold space for those people to be able to make that journey easier for them. So that's the reason that I've written the book is to break that silence and to help ease suffering and pain because you know like that's why we're all here we're all connected we are all just walking each other home in very different ways but that's mm. that's the reality of what we're all here doing and we can do that with love, love and compassion or we can become very self-centered and just think that life is just about our journey but it's not it's about the bigger picture I also wanted to leave a legacy for the generations to come. So I wanted to leave something that would touch those people who, whose lives I'll never, you know, I'll never meet those people. But if I could just help one person, then my, then my work is done. It was very much about that. It and sounds, in terms of the... Please sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, in terms of the work that I, I do now, like I just love supporting people to see themselves, truly see themselves and realize 
who they are, see their potential, connect with the heart space, really help them to live more fulfilled lives. Because I believe that if we were all doing that, we wouldn't have war, we wouldn't have crime, we wouldn't have hate. We would just be so, we'd be in a different space. And again, the ripple effect of that, the ripple effect of the work that you're doing is huge. We don't necessarily see that with our own eyes, but we know from a heart space that, that, you know, we need to do this work. All of us need to do the work on ourselves, but we need to, to do the work for other people. It seems like there's two levels in a sense in your book. One is others who are dealing with infertility and, you know, if, if you have it and obviously not all women do, uh, I mean, a huge amount do, but certainly the secondary infertility that even women that struggle with infertility may not be aware of this, take away the stigma of that and help people, you know, just give themselves some love and grace. But as you've mentioned, there's another level with people that are dealing with shame and self-judgment from any challenge. You know, there's sort of a whole nother level in your, you know, uh, ministry in a sense, your, your work that's so important and and how, and I love this phrase, I think you have it on your profile somewhere, and I love what you wrote. You wrote, you know, if you have an idea or a dream that still needs to be birthed into the world, don't give up. Everything happens in divine timing, and if you keep trusting, the universe will co-create with you. Well, in some sense, the tragedy you went through, you used as a springboard for a dream, for a bigger purpose in your life. And that seems like that's your message to the wider world of, you know, so, so how would you how would you put that message to that wider world, those who are dealing with shame and grief and they may not be seeing themselves as having a dream or they may think to themselves, I'm worthy of nothing. You know, nothing I have can help anybody. I just need to hide in a hole until it all ends because there are some people that feel that way. Just don't look at me because I'm, shun me, please shun me. I deserve to be shunned. Talk about how you have a different vision for people. I think for me, I connect with people on a soul level. So I see beyond all the, the facade, you know, the masks that we wear. And I really encourage people to start to get still. So we've talked about mindfulness. We've talked about, for me, meditation was the thing that saved my life. If I hadn't have learned meditation, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have got through what I went through when I was in hospital in Norway all those years ago. So nature is that thing that helps me every single day to get out of a dark hole or a dark headspace or however I'm feeling. So that is something that each and every one of us can do. Even if you don't believe in yourself, even if you don't believe you're worthy, even if you don't know where your life is going, I really encourage people to go outdoors to just be not do we spend a whole lives doing and we just need to spend more time being and what happens when we're in nature is that everything just starts to fall away our mind the negative monkey mind chatter that goes on constantly starts to lessen and we start to connect with our heart space and when we start to feel that we we start to feel worthy and it's a process and it's a practice and we need to push ourselves to do it and go out even when we don't feel like it. You know, it's like going to the gym. Even when you don't feel like going to the gym, remember the feeling that you had when you come home and mm -hmm. you're like, I did that workout and I pushed myself. We can do that gently. We can do that in nature. We can do that with meditation. We can do that through prayer. We can do whatever our belief system is, but really commit to finding that thing for you that fills you up, that brings you joy because you need to draw on that for when you're going through those challenging times. I just, you know, I know we're uh, getting close to uh, closing, but I want to just dwell a bit on what you've said here, Sarah, because it's, it's so profoundly true. Um, like you, I, I love nature, and, you know, because I'm a reflective person, I can reflect on all sorts of things, some of them positive, some of them not so positive. And just over the weekend, we happen to be in, sort of far northern Michigan uh, uh, for the summer. My wife kind of doesn't like uh, hot weather. She's sort of got a 
Norwegian Irish background. And so anyway, it doesn't get too hot where we are because we're so far north. But, you know, there are just beautiful woods, uh, birch trees, which, you know, you know, obviously have them in the UK. You know, I'm sure if you go up north and certainly in Norway, you would have them yes. uh, when you were there. And, you know, just walking in the woods or we had a, went on this just beautiful bike trail. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, I'm going to focus on being present right here, right now for this second. I'm going to listen to the wind going through the trees, the sunlight kind of speckling through them, looking at the, at the meadows and the fields and the farmhouses in the, different, in, the, in the distance, the beautiful like mid-70s weather, which well, for those in Fahrenheit, probably 20s, Celsius somewhere. Uh, yeah. But I remember thinking to myself, I'm going to focus on being present and being so grateful for this incredible bike ride and then early this incredible walk in nature. And, you know, whoever you believe created it all, it makes you think I'm a part of something bigger than myself and how blessed I am to be experienced this beautiful spot. It, for us, it could be nature. Others, it could be music. Whatever transports yes. you to a place where you're focusing on something that's positive that helps you heal your soul. I mean, it does work, does for me. Yeah, I love walking in nature or cycling in nature. It's, it's awesome. Yeah, it is the most beautiful experience. And I, I didn't realize how connected to nature I was until I moved over to Australia. And I know I'm blessed to live by the beach and, you know, just watching the sunset, the sunrise is so incredibly healing. And it's like you said, you realize you're, you're just a small part in this amazing world. It's just, we're all connected and we're just part of something so much bigger, you know, we're a drop in the ocean, but we're part of the whole ocean. And I think when we really understand that, that is when life changes and gratitude has been huge for me. You know, well, I think you mentioned that three, the G word gratitude have to comment on that. So um, I, I, so love love that point i mean i really and i'm not obviously i didn't create this whole idea there's a bunch of people that have written on gratitude uh but i do try to you know when i start getting negative try to focus on you know i'm so blessed i have a an incredible uh, wife of you know over 30 years i have three adult kids two boys and a girl i'm so blessed uh, by them um you know we go to a non-denominational church in maryland uh, I mean, there's so many things. I, I love what I do in Crucible Leadership and the team that we have. I have a long list of things that I'm so grateful and so blessed by. And so, you know, dwell on the things that you're blessed by. I'm sure you probably have a long list. You have, I'm sure, three mm -hmm. wonderful kids. You live in a beautiful part of the Strait of the Mornington Peninsula, south of Melbourne. I mean, I'm sure you love what you do. You've got a book coming out. I mean, I, those are just a probably, you know, the tip of the iceberg, just of the, of the little things I know that we've spoken about. There's probably a longer list. But, you know, rather yes. than focusing on why life is so bad and life's not easy, just being in nature and, and just being grateful, focusing what you're grateful for, you go through that list after a while, it'd be pretty tough to, you know, for that despondency not to break a little bit, right? Some rays of sh yes. sunshine to break through the clouds. So. Yeah. 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 But I just so want to say with the ahead. gratitude thing too, it can be something really small. And I think for some people when they're in that really difficult mm -hmm. headspace, you can't see, as the saying goes, you can't see the wood for the trees and you can't find the things to be grateful for. So start small. Be grateful for the, the warm cup of tea you're drinking. Be grateful for the hot shower mm -hmm. you had this morning. Be grateful for the bed that you're lying in. But really just start to notice and, and take note and, uh, you know, write things down, three things every morning or every evening, whatever works best for you, write them down. And before you know it, you'll have a whole book of things that you can read back when you're having a really bad day and say, okay, I do actually have these amazing things in life because I think previously I'd thought that you couldn't be happy and angry at the same time. You couldn't have all these conflicting emotions at the same time but you can be going through the hardest time of your life and you can still be grateful. And some of those moments that were the hardest in my life, ironically, I have the most gratitude for those because they had a bigger purpose. They had a bigger purpose. When I think of gratitude, you know, lying in hospital in the most intense pain, 
But one of the things that I'm so grateful for is that lady that came, that consultant that came to speak to me. Those two things at the time were just like, but they can both exist at the same time. You can be grateful and find, you know, moments of happiness even when you're grieving, even when you're going through the hardest times. Also, what can happen at the same time is you can be in a plane and the plane is about to land. And that sound you just heard, listener, was the captain turning on the fasten seatbelt sign, indicating that we're going to land this conversational plane in a bit. But before we do, I have to point out something that I love. I love a lot of things about co-hosting this show. The thing I love the most is when Warwick and the guest speak the same words in different languages, if you will. There have been so many instances in this conversation with you, Sarah, in which you've said something that's a shading of what Warwick talks about all the time in Crucible Leadership. Um, and, And the one that sticks out to me, Warwick defines the end goal of moving beyond your crucible as a life of significance. And he, and he, he defines that as living a life on purpose, dedicated to serving others. And you use the phrase in this conversation when it, it just sort of slipped by, but I wrote it down because it, 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 it strikes me that that's your way of saying st- sort of the same thing. We're all just walking each other home. There's just something so, so beautiful about that idea of, of again, you're you're living your life on purpose. You're you're noticing things and you're serving others. We're all just walking each, each other home. That's just one of the examples, and it's one, just one in this episode in which you guys have talked about similar things, similar rhythms in in different words, and that shows me the universality of the principles of of what we're talking about. I would be remiss before the plane gets on the ground, though, Sarah, if I did not give you the chance to let listeners know how they can get in touch with you, how they can know more about your book and how they can buy your book. So where can they find you on the internet? Thank you. So through my website, sarahwillaby.com.au. I'm also on LinkedIn, Sarah Willoughby 2019 and Instagram and Facebook, Sarah Willoughby Australia. So basically search my name and you will find me. I love connecting with people. Um, in terms of my book, my ebook is being launched on the 7th of June, which also happens to be my birthday. Um, Happy birthday. Very, <laughs> that is you. wonderful timing. Since it's not, yes, yeah, that's, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, and I, I didn't even tell them it was my birthday, but that was what was chosen. So I love that. And seven is a very spiritual number. So it's all just perfectly aligned. Um, so that's available as an ebook on the 7th of June. And then it's available in global bookstores on the 6th of December from all the usual online retailers and and places. So I really encourage people to, um, to, even if it's not for them, there's probably going to be somebody that might need to hear that that story of hope and inspiration. Um, So thank you. Warwick, as always and as appropriate, the last question or two are all yours. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for being here. I just find your whole message so encouraging it's a message of hope and um gosh you know i I feel like you know your story and in part i love the title of your book infertility saved my life it was excruciatingly physically painful spiritually emotionally i don't know i can't think of too many other axes but whatever (laughs) axes there are in life you felt them all at a huge uh you know in a huge way But yet, in some ways, the life you're living, the life of purpose, which you are dedicated to serving others, was birthed in the excruciating pain on every level at that time. And I know it's not easy to understand if today's your worst day, whether it's through infertility or it might be hard to understand, but maybe as a message of hope, talk about how you found some purpose in the pain that you went through, and I know for me, I'm guessing it's true for you, doesn't eliminate the pain, but somehow it makes it easy to deal with. So talk a bit about how that old pain for purpose and infertility saved my life. Talk about a bit about how that crucible may be excruciating, but good can come of it and how it can almost be healing in some ways. I don't know, does that make sense at all? It does. I think for me, I realized that this was bigger than me this wasn't just about me. And when I realized that 
we, I think I went on this journey of realizing that I was enough. Mm. Everybody is enough as they are. And when we get to that place of accepting who we are, flaws and all, then life really does change. And when we realize that we're enough, then we want to find our unique gifts and talents and skills and we want to share those with the world because we need them. You think of all the people that have come before us and all the inventions and all the beautiful things that this world offers us. That was that all happened because people were brave and because they stepped up. And they believed in themselves and they believed in their dream, their goal, their vision, whatever it was. And then they took action. So it's not just enough to have the dream. We've actually got to take those steps. So whatever people need to do to get to that place of feeling enough, we've talked about it, you know, connecting with self, mindfulness, prayer, being out in nature, writing, seeking help from others, connecting with your tribe, whatever it is, do one small thing today. Take one small step right now as soon as you finish listening to this because I learned the hard way how short life is. And would I have had a life of, you know, regret? Would I have? I absolutely would for all the things that I didn't do, for the the fact that the music was going to die inside me, for all the things that I hadn't been brave enough to walk towards. Everybody has that ability, that opportunity right now to draw a line in the sand, whatever they're going through, and say, enough's enough. My life starts again right now. And I really encourage people to do that and to find the tools to help them to do that every day. I have been in the communication business long enough to know when the last word on a subject has been spoken, and Sarah Willoughby just spoke it. She didn't just speak the last word. She also did my job because I was going to like round up all the things that she said as we closed the show, and she just listed them all off. Uh, so I don't have to do that because Sarah is, is such a good communicator that she also gets it, and she summarized it, everything that we've talked about in that last statement. So I'm left with this, listener. Um, You've heard Warwick talk a little bit here about his story, and and you've heard the the commonalities between Warwick's uh, bounce back from his crucible and Sarah's bounce back from her crucible. Completely different crucibles, but the emotional journey back, uh, very similar in some ways. And you can learn more about uh, Warwick's or learn more about it again, Warwick's journey, by uh, by reading his book, buying his book, um, Crucible Leadership, Embrace Your Trials to Lead a Life of Significance, which you can order on our website at crucibleleadership.com. There's also lots of other resources there that Warwick provides. There's uh, blogs. There's an assessment that helps you understand where you are in your own journey in charting a course toward a life of significance. So come to crucibleleadership.com and spend a little time getting to know the, uh, the assets that are there. And since Sarah uh, took my ending away, I'm going to steal an ending from her website because there's, uh, there's as Warwick uh, hinted earlier, there's uh, or said earlier, there's some things on her website that are just really profound. And there's, um, if you, on Sarah's website, when you go there to learn more about her, she gave you the website earlier, uh, there's a slogan at the top right next to her name, Sarah Willoughby. And it says, it says this, and I want to leave you with this based on this discussion, listener. And that is that, Life begins right now. You've got this. That's the message of what we've just talked about. That's the message of Beyond the Crucible. So, listener, until the next time we're together, do remember, we understand your crucible experiences are difficult. They're painful. They're traumatic. They can knock the wind out of your lungs and knock and, and, and change the trajectory of your life. But as Warwick and as Sarah both have talked about today and have proven with their lives, they're not the end of your story. They can, in fact, be the beginning of a brand new, exciting story, one that brings your heart alive, as they've both said, one that if you take one little step at a time, you can get on a course toward the best chapter of the best story of your life, because where it leads you ultimately is to a life of significance. Mm-hmm.